uh, who are pulled out of the situation every year. So how can you say you're a success when this is what we should be gauging ourselves against? Additionally, at this point in time, according to the International Labor Organization, uh, traffickers make $150 billion a year per annum. I sat down and just started adding up on the back of an envelope. It's not hard work to do. Uh, I knew how much money the uh, global NGOs were bringing in to, to grow, uh, to fight human trafficking, uh, and how much money was allocated by governments. And if you add it up at that point in time, this was again about 10 years ago, it's 150 million. Again, failure. If we continue down the path we were on, we felt like we were just going to continue to be doing the same work, pulling people out, but not actually uh, having the effect that on the system level. So yes, very Bay Area, uh, living there as long as I have, being surrounded by the thinking of someone like Steve Jobs, who challenged people at his company to think different about how you approach, for in, this, in his case, it was a piece of technology. I mean, think how long ago, this 10 years ago was barely existed. But think about 20 years ago where technology was at and how quickly things have changed. And that's because someone like Jobs pushed people to think differently about how you do technology. I would argue that we have to approach uh, impact in the same way. We have to think differently about how we uh, address poverty extreme poverty and inequality. It was rooted in our program that this new path really came, came to light for us. We realized through our uh, work directly with survivors of trafficking uh, that uh, in fact we felt like nonprofits could play a major role in scaling great businesses and businesses could have a great role in scaling great nonprofits. And I'm going to explain how and why. So we actually have examples. Uh, but back in 2009, my business partner and I found ourselves in Lima. Uh, we had a very traditional uh, 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 program where we were, I think we were implementing the RAC's approach uh, to raise, raise people out of, uh, uh, raising people out of extreme forms of, uh, forms of poverty, as well as uh, uh, three, four, the main three forms of Forced labor we were finding there were commercial sex trade of children, uh, kids forced to work as domestics, and also forced pregnancy. So we were engaging with those, those uh, kids and getting them out and into uh, homes and shelters, uh, and hopefully then on a path towards elevating into a place of, of restoration and, and uh, agency. Uh, but again, we felt like we could continue to do this work forever, and we would, we would not see the system change that was needed. Uh, and so, similarly, we started looking at our data in a different way. And uh, when we were there in 2009, we engaged with our project director uh, in Lima, and we realized that almost 92% of the kids in our project were actually indigenous from the Amazon, which is a thousand miles away. Uh, from, from Lima. And so in 2009, we started conducting uh, research on the underlying conditions in the Amazon, particularly a region called Madre de Dios. About 60% of the kids, about 92% were coming from this region called Madre de Dios. And we wanted to understand the root causes of why these kids were ending up on the streets in Lima, a thousand miles away. And what we found will not surprise you. Environmental degradation had led to disruption of the way these communities, we engaged with 12 communities, had been living for thousands of years. And in the last uh, 40 years, the first time they've ever been uh, thrust into a cash economy, a market based economy. In fact, there were, uh, uh, when we first engaged with communities uh, about, about 12 years ago, we ran trainings on what, what literally the, the term value meant. Uh, this is thousand dollars, what's a thousand dollars? There was that level of, of uh, training that was needed with some of the indigenous communities that we were working with because uh, you land in Madre de Dios and then take a 15 hour boat ride up the river, 
communities are very, 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 very cut off from uh, knowing what the value of a uh, ton of Brazil nuts might, might yield them. And that's where we were finding is that uh, communities that were sourcing uh, uh, product like Brazil nuts were getting $1 per bushel when they should have been getting $10 per, per bushel. And there was a whole host of reasons why they, they weren't getting the full value of their labor. Uh, but a main, big, big one was just transport, the cost of transport. Uh, another was just the knowledge of the of global market. Uh, three were the, uh, the coyotes, or the, the, the middlemen, who were intentionally keeping the communities in the situation they were in. Uh, uh, but we would sit with community members, with a grandmother who could speak indigenous tongue, a daughter who could speak mostly Spanish, uh, uh, and very little indigenous tongue, and granddaughter who only spoke Spanish, because now the granddaughter is in a cash tongue whereas grandmother grew up in a, in a career uh, context. So all the way from the environmental degradation down to the family level, uh, level of disruption that we found while engaging with the communities. And while talking with the, the community members here, by the way, the picture here was says, I have been exploited at the bottom. That's an illegal gold mine. Uh, I don't recommend you go take pictures of that because they, they will kill you. Uh, these are illegal gold mines. They use mercury, which is destroying the water, to, to pull the, pull the uh, gold out, uh, which is another reason why the communities have been in such a, a, a tough place, because their drinking water is now polluted. Uh, but uh, while engaging with the communities, we realized that, uh, uh, and this, their feedback to us, said, look, we have incredible access to incredible ecological resources. What we don't have is capacity building. We don't have uh, uh, the ability to participate in the marketplace, and we want to. And so over the last uh, 12 years, we've helped engage those communities and, and softly uh, help them enter into the global marketplace. I don't know if this video is going to give us sound, so let's just skip it. Uh, we took that research from uh, 12 years ago with the indigenous communities. And we convened 50 of the top uh, entrepreneurs we knew at the time in the Bay Area. So we started convening people outside of the NGO space and in the business space. And so we had C-suite executives from Facebook and Google and Apple, uh, uh, and people who wouldn't necessarily want to engage on a social issue. Uh, but what we said to them is that we've engaged with indigenous communities that want access to the marketplace and want access to, to uh, to jobs, and they want to create great jobs in their community, and we need your help to figure this out. Uh, importantly, and this was a good learning for us, we got a baseball player, a major league baseball player, who had won three of the previous uh, uh, five World Series, and then we also uh, got the founder of Twitter, Jack Dorsey. We got those two to say, yes, we'll come to this event. You get 48 other people really, really quick when you get those people to say yes. And we pitted these people, these entrepreneurs, against each other to come up with an economic solution. We brought indigenous leaders from the Amazon to be there with us. And the output of that event was actually the baseball player coming up with an idea for, believe it or not, all the really smart people in the room. It was the baseball player who came up with an idea for something called Smart Tea. Because it's smart for the communities, smart for the planet, and smart for you if you drink the tea. And we had, we had, because we had followed the traditional nonprofit or NGO path, we were exhausted from the business model of raising capital that way. And we overlapped it with this learning. And we told the people who can be there, including Jack Diversi, whatever idea you come up with, we're going to do it. And so at that point in time, we actually spun off a beverage company uh, from Not For Sale. Uh, it's a for-profit entity. And we raised for profit capital, and we went and got the best beverage maker in the world, his name is Paula Bakken. Uh, believe it or not, there's a, a, a beverage award given out every year in the United States, and we give awards for everything here. <laughs> uh, but he had, he had just left Zigo, which is a coconut water company. He had developed their top two flavors. And we went and recruited him. We paid him handsomely. Uh, he got equity in the company. Uh, but importantly, 
We spun off a beverage company, Rebel, which stands for Roots, Extracts, Berries, Bark, and Leaves. And within 18 months, we were in the marketplace. Uh, I would like to say that instantly, the communities in the Amazon had engaged in the supply chain. That, unfortunately, was not the case. It took eight years of support of the communities to integrate them into the supply chain of this product. But that's because we were committed to engaging with them and working with them and building out a, a co-op around Brazil nuts with the, with the communities. Today, Rebel is the fastest growing natural organic beverage in the history of the United States. What I just walked through is the origin story of, of a beverage company. Uh, uh, it is valued at $100 million. Uh, very likely will have an exit in the next two to three years, which will come with its own set of extreme, extreme uh, uh, negotiations uh, to hold impact inside this company. And what we did is we built into the bylaws of the, the company the impact we want to see. So Not For Sale owns part of this company. Uh, we have a board seat in perpetuity. So if we're ever acquired, we're still inside. Uh, we're, we're still inside the company. Uh, I'm going to come back to that because it's important. Now uh, we built a supply chain code of conduct when we were when we were a pure charity or NGO focus with the U.S. State Department. We took that code of conduct and we put it inside the, the bylaws of the company and. Uh, we hold our, the company to the standard of being uh, 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 a highly graded company in terms of the uh, likelihood of forced labor. The likelihood of forced labor in the supply chain of this company is very, very low. I can't tell you that any company today is perfect. I wouldn't say that about Rebel. Uh, I think it's as good as it could possibly be today. Uh, but we have to hold it accountable. That's why we have the board seat. And today, uh, Rebel is actually the largest donor of the sale. Uh, we continue to support the communities of the Amazon with philanthropic support on top of the, uh, buying ingredients from the, from the communities. And 100% of the philanthropic support going to the communities of the Amazon come from Rebel. So we're no longer dependent on philanthropic or government funding for that support. And I have here, we want to be a virus. And let me explain why, what that means. So, uh, uh, 10 years ago, I keynoted a, a supply chain event at Coca-Cola. And I felt like I was throwing pebbles at the corporate America's windows. And I realized, we'll never change Coca-Cola and their supply chain practices from the outside. The only way we're going to change a Coca-Cola is by actually being inside and creating value inside of Coca-Cola. And to be very honest with you, Rebel very likely will be acquired by a company like Coca-Cola, or a Unilever, or a Pepsi. Now, one could view that as, wow, you're going to strip out all your impact, you're going to lose all of that. Maybe. We have to do everything to safeguard against that. We were talking about it earlier. We have to build the legal parameters for that not to happen. But we take heart from the example of, of a Ben and Jerry's. And a very good friend of ours is the former CEO of Ben and Jerry's, and a number of the board members at Ben and Jerry's are our advisors through this process. If you know Ben and Jerry's story, they were acquired by Unilever, and the first 10 years were really bad. And so we go, how can we not have a bad 10 years? How can we actually accelerate? We're going we're gonna to have to fight with them and negotiate with them to maintain the core of impact here. But how can we actually learn from Ben and Jerry's experience so that when we go inside of uh, Coca-Cola, we have power? And today, Ben and Jerry's has had major influence within its parent company, Unilever. And one can argue uh, around uh, uh, Unilever's commitment to sustainability. They're very outspoken about it. Uh, but in my humble opinion, that if in my life, I will have an opportunity to be on a board inside of a brand, inside of Coca-Cola, let's say. And if I'm able to help shift the supply chain uh, uh, impact of Coca-Cola, let's say a quarter percent, I can improve the supply chain of Coca-Cola, a global conglomerate, by a quarter percent, in aggregate, that will be more impact than not for sale could have 
then through its direct service work, working with survivors of human trafficking. Now that does not mean working with survivors of human trafficking is work that we will give up. We will continue to do that work. We do continue to do that work. However, we're also utilizing the learnings from that to spin off for-profit entities that can also become viruses inside of larger global ones. I know you've, I've used up my time. Uh, I'll just say it. Rebel is, is the first example. We have 13 other companies that have come behind it. Um, I, I, several of them are on path towards acquisitions as well. We sit on those boards. We use the same uh, 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 approach to embed an impact into the company. Thank you very much.